excited about doing these senior school and talks. So we're going to have to hold him down when he tries to jump up and rip the microphone out of my hand. Um, but it's because he's passionate, obviously, about senior schooling and making sure that um, you guys get the right information and that you're all set on the right pathway. Success and um, your futures. So I feel a bit like, and I don't know if you guys feel the same, but when you get to year 10, it's almost like all of your, your schooling years have kind of built up to this point. You finally get to use the subjects that you want to do to get you on the pathway for life. Um, does anyone feel like that at this point? But yep, a few nods. Um, yeah, so it's a really important time in your life and in your students' lives. And so obviously our aim tonight is to give you as much information as we can without overloading you with information so that we can um, help your students to make important decisions about the subjects that they choose. And there are lots of different options and we'll try and um, speak about as many of those as we can. But by all means, at any point in time, either tonight um, or in the future, you are most welcome to talk with any of us if you've got any other questions. Right, so tonight's session will cover um, our QCE uh, system. So that's our Queensland Certificate of Education. So each student that comes here to Corinda and, and in fact, um, students all around Queensland, the aim is for them to leave school or high school with what we call a Queensland Certificate of Education. So that's like your old high school certificate, year 12 certificate. Um, now, different to um, uh, like a, a statement of results or something like that, at QCE, the Queensland Certificate um, of Education, it's going to just make me, that's okay, I can talk without having that up there. Um, so the Queensland Certificate of Education is something that everyone hopefully will walk away with uh, from their Year 12 studies here at Queensland State High School. The Queensland Certificate of Education is different to and apart from an ATAR school, for example. So if you have a student that you think will go on an ATAR pathway, it's different to that. But the Queensland Certificate of Education is something that is to be earned by the student. And there are um, requirements for how they get a certificate, a Queensland certificate of education, which we will go through in some of the subsequent slides. Do I have the wrong one? Yeah. The old one up. Oh, this is where we all want to be. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, we're going to cover the difference between what we call general and applied subjects in the evening tonight. We're going to talk about an ATAR and what an ATAR score is and what contributes to an ATAR score. We're going to talk about uh, VET pathways, which Ms. Tony will do um, at some point in time later in the evening. And we're going to talk then about our set planning interviews, which is where we come and meet together um, with you and your student to talk about those subjects' choices and how we make those. <coughs> So just going back to what I was talking about with the Queensland Certificate of Education, as I said, it's something that the students will earn during their time here at high school. And there are certain requirements that they have to meet to be able to leave school with their QCE. So they need to earn what we call points, and they will need to earn 20 points to graduate with a QCE. And those 20 points come from different uh, things that they study here at school. So um, the the 20 points need to come from, and you can see down on the, um, on the left hand side at the bottom, then they come from uh, units of work and can either be general or applied subjects that the students have passed. So that's what the set standard means. So they need to pass a unit of work to be able to get the point for that unit. The set pattern, what that means is that they need 12 points from what we call completed core courses of study. So what that means is that we're looking for students to study at least three subjects because generally they get four points all together for a subject and we'll talk about that a bit more as we go on. Um, we're looking at at least three subjects that they do from beginning to end. Now we find that some students along the way want to change subjects that they're studying and we need to be really careful about how many subjects they change and when that occurs because it might interrupt their um, completed core uh, points that come from those courses that they've completed from beginning to end. The other thing that they need, oh, so then they need eight other points which come from different areas. Uh, we'll talk about in a moment as well. They also need to meet some basic literacy and numeracy requirements. So generally that will mean that they pass one unit of work in English and one unit of work in maths at whatever level of maths that they're studying. And we will build into our processes here at Corinda. Um, if that doesn't happen, that we will, um, we will make sure that 
we uh, can be track of all the students that they can meet that component by offering them a literacy short course or a numeracy short course to uh, to make sure that they get that requirement of their QC. So the idea is that everyone leaves Korea with a QC, and I think um, over the years, nine, ten years running, except for last year, we've had one hundred percent of students leave. Okay, so that's a bit more information about the subjects that contribute to the QCE. So you can see at the top there, I was talking about the completed core courses of work that they need to study. And so those are your um, QC, what we call QCAA subjects that most of your students will study here at school. And they can be general or applied subjects. So for example, your modern history and physics, or you might study um, hospitality practices, or whatever the case might be. So any of those general or applied subjects, you can also study general extension subjects. Um, and also a cert two, three or four will also contribute to those completed core. So at Quinda here we have in year 10, which will happen next semester, your students will complete their cert two in active volunteering. So that would be one thing that can contribute to their um, completed core. So you'll see that each of the subjects contributes four points if they pass all of the units. So all of the general and applied subjects through the QCAA have four units of work. So if they pass all four units, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, they will get up to four points. That's why it says up to four points. I will send these um, slides out at the end as well, and hopefully with um, a video as well, so you can listen to that later, the link. But I'll definitely be sending lists of slides out to you just in case you want to you miss anything or the yeah. fine details. All this information is available in different places. So if you go on the QCAA website, all of the information is there. If you have trouble navigating or have any other questions, by all means, get in contact with us. So once they've got their 12 um, credits, uh, 12 points for, from their completed core, they can get then eight points from elsewhere. A maximum of four of those can come from preparatory courses. So the short course in literacy and numeracy that I spoke about just a moment ago is there. They can get one point for that. So one qualifications, they can get up to three points for those um, and other recognised um, preparatory courses. And then some more from what we call complementary courses. So there are a whole range of um, courses that kids can get points from. So, um, you know, if you want to know any more about any other potential courses that your student can do you can get, um, to get credit towards their QC, you can come and see us about that. Uh, no, I said I wasn't going to jump in much, but I will. It's trying really hard. <laughs> um, really that it's at least 12 points from core. They can get as many core points as they want. So core can go on crazy amounts. So our top QC student last year had 42 points at the end. And of that 42 points, they had two prep and everything else is core. Okay, so you can core can keep going on and on. Yeah, so my general aim for all of our students is my starting point isn't 20. My starting point is 24 or 28 to give us a buffer. And then, then we work around things in case something goes wrong. Um, we, we've got room around that. Okay. And that's a part of the reason why we will be um, the active volunteering in year 10 as well, not only to uh, create citizens that are volunteers in the community, but also to give them that additional four points as a starting place. Um, so there are lots of things that we do here at Corinda that will um, you know, ensure that your students get to where they need to be and we can keep a close um, eye on how they're tracking throughout their studies to make sure that they are on track to get their PC. Um, so these are the literacy and numeracy requirements. Remember down in the bottom right hand corner, um, they have to get their literacy or numeracy, and there are a number of ways that they can get that. And again, that's something when we're doing our meeting with you, our set plan meeting, we will make sure that that is built into their courses of study. If for some reason that they are not passing, for example, they don't pass a unit in English or a unit in maths, and they're looking like they might not get their literacy or numeracy requirements, then we will, for example, um, recommend that they do or put them in a class where they do the literacy short course and the numeracy short course. Um, any students that choose the um, FSK subject, which is the Cert 2 in Skills for Work and Vocational Pathways, which is a subject that they can choose and study here at Corinda, we build that um, numeracy component into that course. So that will get that from, from there. Um, but yeah, there are numerous ways that we can get that sort of. Okay, so what we're here to talk about mainly is about your students, along with you, making informed decisions about what um, subjects they're going to choose moving forward depending on their chosen pathway. So 
depending on whether they can see themselves at uni or going into a trade, for example, or further study in a different field or whatever the case might be. So we would encourage um, your students to choose in their planning, for their set planning and um, for their future pathway, think about things that they are good at. So what are their strengths? So thinking about what subjects they study at school that they generally achieve well in um, or other things that they do um, here at school that um, uh, their strengths or that they're good at. The other thing that we would ask your students to consider is what are their interests as well. Um, sometimes they're the same thing, sometimes they're different. So you can be good at something, not be that interested in it or vice versa. Um, but both of those things will obviously help when choosing your subjects um, because they're more likely to lead to a pathway that either you're good at or you're interested in or hopefully both. Um, and of course the values, so that will, you know, when you're thinking about what kind of career you would like to do or what you'd like to do when you leave school, um, your core values come into that. So what, you know, where do you see yourself in five years time? Um, do you see yourself, you know, working with the community? Do you see yourself as the CEO of a big company or, you know, what is it that, um, you aspire to Your values can be a huge range of things. It could be like family values. It could even be religious values. So I've had students in the past, which, yeah, you know, for them, they had other pathways they want to do post school, but we made sure that we still had that QC back up there and we made sure we worked around their values so that we could still have success in multiple different ways when they got to the other end. Generally, find, you know, seeing students come through year after year, um, most often, if students have chosen subjects that they are interested in or good at, or hopefully both, and that aligned with their values and what they want to do with when they leave school, then they're much more um, likely to have success in those subjects. So it's it's really important to think about all of those different areas and how we can bring that together to choose a good set of subjects that will um, speak to all of those things. Which brings me to my next slide. Now, we are currently updating the handbook. Now, that um, um, that handbook was published last year, and it's for the 2022-2023 cohort. So they're the students that are currently in year 11 going into year 12. You will have a new handbook. We are just going through and making sure that all the finer detail of that is spot on so that when it gets published to you, you will know exactly, um, you know, what you can choose and all the information around it. So we will notify um, the students, obviously, and that will come out at, in their set planning pack. Um, it will be published on our school website. So and if you can't find a copy of it, absolutely email us if you find us and we can get one to you. And that will come out shortly. Um, so that will have all the information. So it's a pretty big book. I've got some information in it. All right, so when we're choosing subjects, there are different types of subjects that your students can choose to study here at Corinda. Um, they can choose a what we call a general subject. So the general subjects are the QCAA subjects that are, I suppose, considered your more academic subjects. So as I mentioned before, your accounting, your modern history, your physics, chemistry, biology, um, specialist maths, maths methods, um, you know, all of those um, subjects that you can think of that are those more academic subjects. Then they can also study what we call applied subjects. So that's where it's taking a bit more of a practical um, component to it. So your hospitality um, studies, you might be doing business studies, um, those kind of applied skills. They're a little bit less um, on the academic side of things. So the academic rigour is not quite there, um, but really good for any student that is thinking of going into a more hands-on kind of pathway. That includes also um, students who are not doing so well or struggling a little bit with their English and maths. They can do an applied English or maths subject called essential English or essential maths. And again, we'll talk to you about those options at your step planning meeting if you're not sure um, which way to go. Then we also have the option of choosing a number of different vocational and educational training um, subjects. Ms. Dillon will talk a bit more about that a little bit later, but there are a number of different options that the, the students have got here. And the thing is that they don't need to pick all general subjects, or all applied subjects, or all vet subjects, we can certainly put a mixture together depending on, you know, what, what you want to do or what your student wants to do when they leave school or what those interests and values um, and strengths are. So it will be tailored to your student. So each student will choose um, six subjects that they choose to study. 
So the, the reason we do that um, is it gives them the maximum opportunity to get those QCE points that we talked about earlier. It also helps them with their ATAR pathway if that's a pathway that they have chosen. Only five subjects need to count to their ATAR score. However, we ask the students to study six, which most high schools around do, so that it gives it a little bit of buffer zone or a bit of a leeway in case one of their subjects doesn't go according to plan, in case they don't do as well as they had hoped to. So all of the students will study six subjects, and again, it can be a mixture of those general applied or BEC subjects. And um, as I said before, aligning those to the typical post-school pathways, career pathways, is, is the most important thing. Particularly, there's a lot of um, a lot of things we talk about tonight are the general things, and obviously there's some things that go outside of that. And I've got um, one student in the audience I saw walking before that I had a conversation with just this week, no, last week, um, which we talked about the fact that they'll probably end up coming out with seven subjects when they finish, because there's other things that sometimes happen that allows you to um, do extra subjects without doing extra work. So we talked about how they could be smart and they might be able to pick up an extra subject without doing too much. Okay, so there's always things that fit outside the rules. So these are all the general rules we talk about tonight. That is exactly what the student I was talking to talked to them about. Yeah. So yeah, there's scope for a lot of different things. We have um, some students, there are 25 year 12 students this year that will be studying what we call a senior external examination, where they don't actually study the subject here at Corinda. They um, study that externally, so they might um, employ a tutor or go to you know, school on the weekend or whatever the case might be. Um, and they just sit the external exam at the end of year 12 and then if they pass that exam, they get the points towards that. So that's like a seventh subject. So generally for us, sorry, generally for us is usually languages. So often we have students which, because um, we have, I only worked out the other day, I think we're still at 69 different languages spoken at home um, across our school. And so uh, quite a few of those languages are actually covered by these SEEs. And so what happens is that we don't teach it here at school. So it might be Arabic, or it might be Vietnamese or some of that. So they're the common ones. Um, so they come in at home. They've learned how to read and write it. They know how to speak it. Um, they're at the level where they can actually do quite well at it. And so they come in and do basically just two exams at the same time as um, the external exams are on, right at the end of grade 12, and they get recognition for a whole subject. It counts as a whole subject, like as if they've been studying it the whole time. So it's, And because we have such a range of people at our school of different backgrounds, um, it's actually a lot of people do different languages in that time, so it's, so it's quite useful. Yeah, and we'll let the students know when those opportunities are available um, and all that kind of thing. So there are a lot, so many options for all of our students. We do also have some students that study subjects via distance education that are here at school because that a subject that they really must study, for example, Chinese or, or something that we don't um, necessarily offer here or this subject. So like this year in grade 12, we you know we have five languages we actually teach at the school, but sometimes we just can't actually get enough students to put a teacher on it. So we have five kids, four kids what? studying German by distance ed. So they come in in the mornings and they do a distance ed class, um, even though we teach German all the way up through grade 12 normally. Um, particularly this particular group of grade 12s, when they did some selection, there wasn't enough of them wanting to continue in German. So we still gave them the opportunity. And so what we do is we apply to distance ed saying that as a school, we can't supply it. They do a small test for distance ed, they still get in and they we support them by they come and do German up in our senior schooling area. And then they will still get recognition as if German is a full subject. Yeah. Through our distance ed. I have a student in year 12 at the moment who really wanted to study specialist maths, but it just didn't fit in his time to have when the specialist maths class was on here at school. So he's studying that way distance ed. Um, and so the parents are here. <laughs> um, yeah, so lots and lots of opportunities. Um, so we'll just quickly touch on, and, and this is a little bit um, far away at the moment, but just to give you an idea about the assessments and how it works for our general and applied subjects. So there are our QCAA subjects that the students study. They were study units one and two roughly in year 11. And in fact, we finished that at the end of term three, or just at the beginning of term four in year 11. And so if they pass each of those units individually, if they get a satisfactory result in unit one, they will get one QCE point. Then they get a satisfactory result in unit two, they get another QCE point. If they get an unsatisfactory result, then they don't get the QCE point for that unit. 
Now, the kicker comes when they get into their year 12 studies, which starts at the end of year 11, their units three and four. Now, they come as a unit pair. So what that means is, so I always say to the kids, it's double or nothing. So they either get the two points or they get zero points. So what that means is when they do units three and four, they're the ones that count towards their ATAR, those units count towards their ATAR, and they need to pass units three and four together overall to get the two points for those subjects. So it's really important that we're using year 11 as that opportunity to settle into the subject, to find your feet, make sure you're in the right subjects, getting all of those study skills and everything up to scratch so that as soon as they hit the end of year 11, term four of year 11, um, they are full speed, all right, and going into their senior studies because that's when it starts proper. Um, yeah, so it's just something to be aware of, I think is really important. Um, so the three and four must be studied as a whole year subject. We do allow a little bit of movement in units one and potentially unit two. So if a, subject, if a student is um, has chosen six subjects and they come to me after a couple of weeks here in year 11 and they say, oh my goodness, this is a nightmare. I hate these subjects. I never knew it was going to be like this. I really want to change out of biology and I want to study knitting, <laughs> for example. Um, and so we can do some subject changes. However, it is a bit of a difficult process and it can be a little bit traumatic for everyone involved. So we do encourage the students <coughs> to hopefully get their subject choices correct at the beginning. But we do have that little bit of movement we can allow for units one and two. When we get to units three and four, we cannot have any more movement in subjects because they then won't get that little three, four pair. Um, and if we're changing halfway through unit three or even unit four, then they've missed out all of that assessment prior to that. And there's basically next to no chance of them passing those units overall. So it's a, that's why we're holding this information night tonight. And I know it's really typical because in year 10, um, we don't all know what we want to be yet. Uh, and so there will be some degree of change. Um, kids change their minds. Your interests change. What you're good at sometimes changes as well. But, um, you know, as much as we can, we're looking at making informed decisions to get those subjects right so that we don't have that trauma that I keep calling it <laughs> of changing subjects. Because um, it's difficult. It's difficult on the student um, changing subjects and changing teachers. All right, so as I said before, if they don't pass any of those units, those um, points don't go towards their QCE and, of course, um, won't be credited towards their ATAR if they don't pass. Um, and so that's why it's important if they're, they're in subjects that they're going to succeed in. Okay, so if you have any more questions about that, we can um, chat that in like. All right, so um, in our general subjects, um, the students have what we call internal assessments and external assessments. In the essential and applied and vet subjects, they are all more or less what we call internal, so they're done here at school. The external ones are done here at school as well, by set, but set by an external authority. So in the general subjects, which are a bit more academic subjects, they will do three what we call internal assessments that are set by the teachers here, and they are sent into QCAA to be um, endorsed by the QCAA to say, yes, they're valid assessments that you can give to your students. And then our students sit those um, and their results are confirmed again by the QCAA. Now, for most of our subjects, um, that would be about 75% of their marks for that subject. And then 25% will come from what we call an external exam that they sit at the end of year 12. Um, and that is set by the QCAA. So by the external authority, we don't know what's on the exam. It just comes to us in a sealed package and the kids sit the exam. In sciences and maths, however, that external exam is actually worth 50% of their result in that subject. So it's quite significant, and we do a lot of preparation, obviously, for the students to be able to sit those external exams in maths and science, but that's um, a significant thing to keep in mind uh, when, when you know, working through your, your 11 and 12 studies. Um, okay. Assessment to the way off yet, so we can um, talk about that one a bit later. Okay, so any student that is on what we call an ATAR pathway. Mm -hmm. Now, an ATAR pathway is where your student is hoping to get an ATAR score at the end of their um, studies at, uh, here at Corinda, and that will give them direct entry into university depending on the requirements of the course that they're wanting to go into and what the prerequisites for that course are. To get an ATAR, 
the students need to study five of those general subjects, so those subjects that are a bit more on the academic side, um, or they can study four general subjects and one applied subject or four of their qualification um, at a Cert three or higher. So that's where I said we can, you know, often have a mix. Generally, I would say the applied subjects, um, you've probably heard about this um, scaling, about subject scaling a bit different to others. Um, it's very complex and a lot goes into it. And so um, be very careful when you hear people talking about subjects and how they scale, because uh, uh, it's not as straightforward as saying, you know, um, physics scales higher than dance or something like that. It's not always the case. But I would say generally the applied subjects um, probably don't contribute to as high ATAR as the general subjects do. So that would be something that you would be considering as well. If you want to go on to do a course at university that requires a very high ATAR score, then we would be looking to choose all the general subjects that are going to contribute to a higher ATAR score. But again, in our set plan interviews, we can guide you on that process. Remembering that there's lots of pathways to get where you want. It's about making sure the students are doing stuff they enjoy and they're good at so they can actually get there eventually anyway if we have to, even if we have to find a slight variation on the way. Yeah. Um, just want to give an example of why the why I don't believe some of the websites you go to with the predictive stuff is that um, last year, um, I think a, a sound in general mass, so a C in general mass, um, would not have scaled as well as an A in religious studies. Okay, so sometimes an applied subject, depending on the students doing it, can actually still scale really quite highly, even though it's not a general subject, but it's subject to subject based. So just don't trust any of those websites you can go to. We just type in and go, oh, I'm gonna see what I get, because they can be very incorrect. And from year to year, it can change dramatically, depending on the students across the state that study it. If I took every single smart kid in the state and got them to go and do media and arts, then media and arts is gonna do very well for entry to university. Okay, because it's based around achievement of the students and how well they go is what controls it. Yeah, it also depends how they go in that one. So if they get an A in that in a high scoring subject, then they're yeah. going to scale very well. But if they're not doing very well, if they've just break through to the past, then you know it could be comparable to most other subjects. So it really depends on so many factors. So please just be very, very careful about any information that you hear on the grapevine about subjects and how they scale. All right, people can give a bit more informed information about that. So as I said earlier, your students will study six subjects. Five of those subjects contribute towards their ATAR score, and we build that sixth one in as that buffer in case something goes wrong, in case they don't do very well at it. And often the students won't know which of their five subjects actually contribute to their ATAR. So they might study six subjects and do reasonably well in all of them, um, or mediocre in all of them, or yeah. whatever the case might be, and the five best ones, the five best scaling one, ones will contribute to their ATAR and might not ever know what those five are. So what we encourage your students to do is obviously their best in all six of their subjects so that they have the best opportunity to get the best ATAR that they can. So score ranges from zero to 99.95 is the highest, it's a 2000 point scale. Um, it's okay though, they don't publish the ones below 30. So <laughs> is it below 30? <laughs> yeah. Um, but obviously a lot of that kids are up um, in the top there. So the other thing that we need to know is that to, to be eligible to get an ATAR score, your student needs to study English. <clears throat> now, um, there's also other things to consider here. So general English and English as uh, an additional language or literature, which are our general subjects, will all allow entry usually into university subjects. <clears throat> Essential English, which is an applied subject, is not generally a prerequisite into university, but they can study essential English and still get an ATAR score. So we've got to be really careful about, you know, the mix of subjects that your student does, what course they're potentially wanting to get into at university to make sure that they choose the right English, for example, because they all have to study English. Um, um, I've got, <laughs> I know, I've just now got a um, home stay, is that the right words? parents in your audience, um, for uh, international students, particularly some of our domestic students as well, sometimes they want to study interstate and interstate sometimes has slightly different rules around that as well. So we just, when it comes to international students, when it comes to your subject selection part, and we're picking that English, um, I just 
I'd like to make sure that we're aware it's an international student and we pick the best English or they at least know what mark they have to get. Because in Queensland, EAL, sound, counts the sound as a sound in English. But in Victoria in particular, their EAL course is not at the same standard as the Queensland course. The Queensland course is pretty much equal with English. They want you to get a B in English as a prerequisite to get into their courses. So there's so any kids that want to study interstate in particular, I'd like to have like well, that's a separate conversation to have at a set plan time to make sure you get the right English that you want to do. Or at least the right marks, know where you're heading. Yeah, yeah. so as you can see, it's all a really tailored process to your student to make sure that we're seeing them on the right path. Right, we've got, I'm going to try and place the video. Good question. Yeah. Yes, English is compulsory, but does, does it have to count as the five subjects? No, so um, English is compulsory, so they have to study either essential or general or EAL or literature, so one of those four subjects. Um, but it may or may not count towards their ATAR. So they have to study it, but it might be, it might end up being their sixth scaling subject, depending on how they go, and it may not count. But they do have to study it. Yeah, good question. <laughs> Right, we will have questions at the end. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try and put the video a bit temperamental. This video is a good nice summary of pretty much everything we've said so far, and it's, um, it just puts in a nice, easy way for you to remember a lot of it. Ask me to log in. The Australian Tertiary Admission Act will replace the overall position as the primary pathway to tertiary oh, study for the year 12 students. To be ATAR eligible, students must complete either five general subjects or four general subjects and one applied subject or vet course. English is compulsory, but there are five English subjects to choose from. A process called scaling will then be applied. The purpose of scaling is to prevent the unfairness that will occur if we simply add up more subject results. Now, we've spoken a lot about the ATAR, but it's not the only path to uni. Met courses and applied subjects can also meet students the requirements they need. And there are other life opportunities too. TAFE, apprenticeships, a gap year, even work. The future is in front of Queensland students and it can be extraordinary whichever part they choose. We're all in this together, and together we'll make the transition to ATAR a positive experience for every student in Queensland. Right. Okay, um, that video is slightly shorter. <laughs> Sorry, um, QTAC has taken down the video we normally show, so we had to find it this afternoon. Um, normally, there's a section in the middle there where I talked about scaling. What that goes into is it just talks about the fact that what we talked about before with a student needs to do the best they can to get the best raw mark. And, and if that subject doesn't scale as well, but it comes down a bit, it's still better than doing that than doing a subject they struggle with, getting a low mark, and then having it scale up. So it's about making sure you get the right balance so that way the student can be successful across all their subjects. There's no point putting all your effort in the one and then not doing well in the other four that you need to get your ATAR sort of thing. So that's what that the middle part of the video is about, which, sorry, I didn't realise is missing because um, QTAC's actually taken that video down. You can't get it anymore. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I think the key message is choosing subjects that you enjoy and that you're good at and just doing the best you can in all of the subjects that you're in, um, with a bit of guidance and information um, from us, depending on those in halfway years. So the other point, so I suppose if we're talking about the process of, of choosing subjects, one of the things that we need to consider is obviously, are we going to be ATAR eligible or are we not going to be ATAR eligible, depending on whether um, your student decides that they would like to go to university. 
But the other thing that we need to consider from a Corinda State of High School perspective is prerequisites for the subjects that we offer here. So, for example, um, if we have a student that um, maybe struggles a little bit in maths, for example, and they come in and they say, Mr Noble, I really want to do specialist maths, which is the, like the high, but like the math C. Um, you know, we might be kind of saying, well, that's going to be, might be a bit tricky for you. Uh, um, and we have prerequisites in place to help the students to make informed decisions about what they're capable of at the same time. So what we don't want to do is set up our students for failure. All right, we don't want to put them in a whole lot of academic subjects that they're not going to be able to cope with or vice versa. All right, so what we do is we publish for each of the subjects that we offer here at Corinda a set of prerequisites. So they're the grades that they need to achieve in year 10 to be able to get into the subjects that they choose in years 11 and 12. So in your um, subject selection handbook, which is the one that I said that we're just um, updating at the moment, which will be published shortly, on the last couple of pages, there's a list of prerequisites for subjects that the students can choose. Not all of them have prerequisites, but most of them do. So you can see, for example, um, if a student wants to get into legal studies, they need to have achieved a B or higher in humanities in year 12. Um, and you can see that they're all listed there. So that will help you to have those discussions with your student about what um, subjects are available to them. If it comes to the set planning process and um, your student is like, oh, I really want to do maths methods, for example, but I haven't got my C plus in um, extension maths, then it doesn't mean that we're going to rule them out forever. Um, the set planning process occurs at the beginning of term three, and so we've really only got one semester's year 10 results. So what we'd ask your student to do then is we'll make a note on their set planning that they really want to do this subject, but they haven't met the prerequisite for it yet. And then they've got that six months for the rest of year 10 to work really hard to see if they can meet that prerequisite to get into that subject. So we do obviously take account for that as well. well We'd like to obviously give opportunities where we can. At the end, I'll go through how the subjects are, uh, choices are done and stuff like that as well, um, because they have actually, EQ has just this year caught up with where we've been at with doing that sort of thing. And they've actually changed. So any parents in here that have had students go through and past, and they've had to do the set plan careers part in one school, they've actually changed that totally this year to make it so it actually allows students to show progress starting now of their choices on the way and on the journey as it goes. So there's opportunities there to go, oh, you know what, I actually want a reset plan. And yes, you actually had opportunities in one school to be able to do all that as well. So we'll yeah. go through that. Yeah, so it's not um, just a one-off process that we do once and we never reset. Mm. You will have the opportunity then at the end of the year, if required, to do a reset plan. Um, and so thinking that all of those, that time about the subjects that your student has chosen, is it still the subjects that they're good at? Is it still the subjects that interest them? Um, is it still the career path that they want to follow? If not, then let's do a reset plan to make sure that before they get into year 11, they're on the right pathway um, to set them up for success. Um, the other thing, obviously, that we need to know, and, and I spoke briefly about before in choosing the subjects, is what the prerequisites are for the courses they want to study when they leave school. Um, QTAC published on their website all the information that students need to determine you know, what courses they want to go into and what those prerequisites might be. So, for example, I think if you want to study teaching, for example, now you need to have studied a science. Um, but again, Ms. Black is the absolute expert in all things getting into university and QTAC, so she can help students to choose the subjects that will help them to get into the courses they want to get into. Yes, and I'll just jump in there as well. Um, so, I can speak to all, all of the students around, regardless of which pathway they choose, or if there are students who go, I absolutely don't know which pathway I want to go, or I have a rough idea that I want to do something in the health sciences, but I'm not quite sure where to find that information. Um, students can reach out to myself uh, via email um, and make an appointment to have a careers discussion with me. I'm more than happy to do that at any point throughout the year, whether that's pre or post set planning. Um, and even into year 11 and 12, I'm still having those conversations. Um, so I'm more than happy to support students in either pointing them in the right direction to where to find the information or starting right from scratch and going, who are you, where do you see yourself in X amount of years and how I can support them to get there. One of the things we said to students last Tuesday too is that obviously part of this investigation is they start looking for the future more and they look for prerequisites. But we also talk to students about there's prerequisites, but there's also a little bit of a thing called assumed knowledge. Okay, so 
just because um, a, subject, a degree at uni says you don't need a subject doesn't mean I don't have to study at all at school because sometimes they have a bit of assumed knowledge and it's very useful to still study at school. They'll let you in because universities are still about putting you know bums on seats and getting people in. But you might turn up there and you might actually find that the first, the second year course, part of the course you're doing, they assume you know some stuff from a subject you should have done at high school, but they didn't have as a prereq. Um, we all have examples. Well, my example is always that in my biology degree, even though I was a math for years, my biology degree, one of the hardest things in human physiology was the chemistry in it. And if I hadn't done chemistry at high school, I would have struggled to do a biology degree because the chemistry is what I needed to get through. So, yes, it might not be a prereq, but some of it's assumed knowledge. So we usually try to help you with that, as you said, plan two, to make sure we're being a bit wise. It's not just about doing it, it's about being wise about what we pick as well. Speech therapy. Some of my words. <laughs> At, um, when I left high school to go to university and I hadn't studied biology and as you can see I'm not a speech therapist now <laughs> because I found that extremely difficult. The biology wasn't a prerequisite, it was just assumed knowledge and it was just beyond what I could do. Um, I'd like to think that I'm a fairly smart person and I did pretty well at uni but that was one thing that was pretty much insurmountable to me. So it's really important that we're considering um, you know, all of the aspects of, of what your student wants to do and where they want to go. Um, and look, oh, I say this to all of the students as well, in saying all of this, oh, we've got to get it right and, and blah, blah, blah. The thing is that what we do here at school and what we decided our set plan meeting is not set in stone. It doesn't mean that we, we have set you on a pathway to be a vet. That is all you're ever going to do, <laughs> right? It doesn't work like that. We will talk to you about options. We will try and do, um, you know, set you on a pathway that has options for you. Um, and things change. And there are always ways to get to the place that you want to go in, in different ways. So, um, yeah, it's not the deal and end of the world. We want to get it right if we can, but it's not um, the end of the world if we don't. All right, so we've spoken a lot about um, our ATAR subjects and getting into university. But of course, not all of our students here at Kabinda are going to be um, going to university or be on what we call an ATAR pathway. There are lots of other pathways that the students can take, and that might mean um, choosing all or most applied subjects um, or a combination of some VET subjects as well, um, which means that they won't be eligible for an ATAR, which means they don't have that direct entry into university, but it means that then they have um, lots of pathways or lots of different other options. So I think that's where Ms. Black's going to come and talk to you about entry into university. Yeah, am I going up there? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Why not? If I have to stand up, I'll give you two. Hi, folks. I'm pretty loud. I don't know if I need the mic, but um, I'll go from there. Um, so in previous years, students could use an individual rank from their Cert 3, Cert 4 or A diploma. So when students uh, study and achieve that level of qualification, there is what they call a selection rank that is associated with that score. Uh, and each year universities will release information regarding their net entry pathway. So certain universities will say, okay, you either need this ATAR score or you need to have this particular selection rank, which for example, a diploma might give that student. Not all universities will allow that. Um, and not all courses will accept entry on the VET qualification alone. But if a student were to not study the, you know, the ATAR pathway, so that subject combination, and they did a, an applied combination of subjects that had a certificate course in there, they would still be eligible to apply to university. Um, as I mentioned, not all courses, not all universities, but there is quite a large range um, of courses available to them, which again is a conversation that we can have at the set planning process and throughout senior years. So it's not just I'm doing an ATAR general subject combination, I'm going straight to uni or I'm not. Um, there are different options, more flexible options if a student wants to go to university or perhaps at this juncture is unsure, which is of course perfectly reasonable. Um, if you uh, so they're going, well, I'm not really sure if I want to go straight into uni. I'd like to do some applied subjects. I want to keep my options open. 
then that option is a very viable one for you. Um, as I said prior, um, you can students can book appointments with me, students and parents and families can book appointments with me if you'd like to come along with your young person as well, um, by all means, and we can have those discussions around how to get into your desired pathway or your career of choice. Okay, so I'll go through um, some of the VET opportunities for students um, in their senior years at school. Uh, so VET stands for Vocational Education and Training, um, and it's learning directly related to work. Um, so they're nationally recognised qualifications and they're developed by industry um, to upskill students uh, in the skills required for particular jobs. And VET can take you... Sorry, oh, is that there? I thought you were going to try yesterday. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, where that can take you is quite diverse. You can go on to do a traineeship or an apprenticeship. Um, you can do further vet studies or into direct employment. Um, and as Ms. Black has just mentioned, it can be an entryway into university. So, there's a few ways you can study vet while you're at school. You can either study it at Corinda State High School in our school timetable or you can study a VET course that's provide, um, through an external registered training organisation uh, and the student would travel uh, to that organisation one day a week and this school one day a week and then they'd be likely put on a study line um, to catch up on what they missed that day um, in our school timetable. There's quite a few different funding issues around studying VET um, while you're at school. One way is if you study a VET course where we are the registered training organisation that delivered that VET qualification, and if it's one of those VET courses, there'll be some small fees applied with that, um, but effectively it's somewhat free. The first example of that is the one we talked about before, the certain um, active volunteering. Um, that's obviously a school-based subject, we own that. We've worked with Volunteer in Queensland to develop it, but we own it, so we're the RTO, so it has like a very small, minimal amount of fee. Most of it's just to cover the fact that when you earn a VET certificate, you have to be presented like a proper, like actual degree, so like an actual certificate, which has to be done on special paper. So a lot of it just covers the actual printing cost of that, as far as that goes. It's true. It is true. <laughs> Yeah, there's a range, you know, but like that's a good example. Of, yeah, yeah, because you're getting a national recognised qualification, um, there's a lot of um, hoops that we have to jump through to award a VET qualification. Um, the other way is if you study it through an external RTO, um, and you can still study. We have some partnerships with external RTOs where students study that in our timetable, or they go off site. But if that VET course is delivered by an external RTO, uh, if it's VET is funded students are covered by that bucket of funding. And my next slide will go into what VETUS funding is. Um, and you can only enrol in one of these. And the third way with the fees associated with the VETUS uh, VET course at school um, is through an external RTO and students um, will pay a full fee for service. Um, and that they all vary depending on what the qualification is. Um, and so we'd let you know how much that would cost in total. In our subject selection handbook, we do have the common ones, that the more popular ones that students choose to study and the information about where their students would study that and the cost if it's um, full fee for service or it's funded with VEDIS um, is on that page for the subject as well for you to have a look at. VEDIS funding, VEDIS is VET in schools and VEDIS qualifications are funded by the VET investment budget and they're listed on the priority skills list. And these are at a certificate one or a certificate two level. Um, and the government has decided what skills we need to upskill people in. Um, and then from there, the VETUS stream list um, include VET qualifications that fall within that priority skills list identified by the Australian government. If students wish to undertake a VETUS funded course, they need to be fully aware they can only be subsidised by VETUS funding once. So if you use that in year 11, because typically a lot of them only go for one year, um, you can't choose another course the next year and be funded by VETUS again. 
Um, visa students may have different funding arrangements, and so we look at that on an individual basis in your set planning. So I just got some common ones, more popular ones on the board here um, that students choose to study in year 11 or 12. And so some of these are in our school timetable as an option, and some of these students will travel to the external provider one day a week. I'll let you go through them. But on that, um, if you have a real passion in an area that's not listed here or in our subject selection book and you can't find it online, come and see us because if, if you are, for example, a certificate to in Auslan, um, we spoke to a student, we did some research and found out you can do it in Maruka and it was VETUS funded um, and we can support you finding how we can get you into a qualification like that. Um, just because it's not one of the popular ones doesn't mean it's not an option for you. So just come and see us. Our, um, that QC award from last year, when she came up the stage, um, the 42 points, she had two Cert 3s, uh, of which none was funded. So it was all full fee. So she did one full fee course when she was in grade 10. I don't like to advertise grade 10 ones, but she did grade 10 one. Uh, and then continue, when she completed that, she then went on and studied another full Cert 3, full fee paying, uh, and then started actually doing her own business based around that as well. So then started paying back for her. So even though the government didn't see that as being worthy, she actually had it worthy herself and turned it into her own little entrepreneurial business and helped her make money as well. So, you know, that's why if, if you can find one, or if your student has some particular passion, Miss Dillon's a whiz at finding the way of finding it, okay, and helping us get there. Get on the phone straight away and we'll just find out. Um, so, I mean, going out one day a week to study um, at an external organisation, there are processes and procedures around that. Um, so as we said, that'd be one day a week. Um, if it is an external vet course, that can count towards your ATAR if it is a Cert 3 or higher. Um, if your student chooses to enrol in, a, in an external vet qualification, they need to manage their own enrolment, their attendance, um, and keeping up with their study that they miss while they're at school, while they're out of school one day a week. Um, however, we are really supportive of students going and doing these external vet qualifications. Um, and so we are here to support them and do what we can from our end. Um, but the main onus would be on travel arrangements, getting there and back one day a week and managing your attendance and your enrolment. Um, but again, we're here to support. And some of those courses, actually a lot of them will attract the better funding. Um, the last thing I just wanted to touch base on is some students choose to or are able, successful in finding a school-based apprenticeship or a traineeship. Um, and so that means they start work while they're at school and so when they learn, they earn. So they go out one day a week and for per nominal year, they do need to complete 50 days. And so if you consider that we're only at school for 40 weeks a year, then you're out 40 days in the school terms, and so you have to make up those other 10 days on the weekend or the school holidays. So they just need to keep that in mind. If it's a school-based apprenticeship, they go out one day a week, and then when they finish school, the assumption is they would transition into a full-time apprenticeship with that employer, and they would complete that apprenticeship post-school. If it's a school-based traineeship, they need to finish that with by the end of year 12. So those 50 nominal days per year are really important to finish them. Um, and yeah, the expectation is they're finished at the end of year 12. We do have a site where we post um, mainly school-based traineeships, but some apprenticeships um, on our SharePoint. And we're just working on creating a link from DAMAC to that SharePoint because our students are getting their notices on DayMap this year now. So we're working on them, but students, if they're interested in that, can go on to that link and see what is being advertised currently, or I will send an email out um, to the whole cohort if I think it's a really good opportunity. Um, just one point I wanted to make there. We have many students at Corinda that are studying some kind of um, school-based traineeship or apprenticeship or whatever the case might be. And as Ms. Dillon said, we are so supportive of students going out to do those things 
if that's their desired pathway. Just to keep um, in mind though, if you're a student that is on an ATAR pathway and studying five or six general subjects, that's probably something that we may not support for you um, because it re would require you to be out of school one day a week and um, doing you know, five or six highly academic subjects and being out of school one day a week is probably not a great idea. So, um, I mean, it's not impossible, but it's something that we do on a case by case basis. Um, so uh, on an ATAR pathway, generally you're here at school for the five days a week. Doesn't mean that we can't do it ever, but it means that we put, need to put a bit more consideration into it. Okay, so um, are we all awake? Hopefully I haven't put anyone to sleep yet. <laughs> um, so the last couple of things that we just wanted to let you know about is, um, as you heard last Tuesday it was that we spoke to your students about similar information here. So they're starting to get that information about um, thinking about careers, thinking about their interests, thinking about what things they're good at and where they want to be um, in five years' time or, or what they want to do when they leave school. Um, and as a part of that, we're offering a career expo right here in the hall uh, tomorrow morning from 9 till 11 as a part of the Leadership Day and Perma Day that many teams are involved in tomorrow. We're going to have about 20 exhibitors that will be here, um, different universities um, and other trained providers that will be here that your students can get information from and discuss possible options and things like that. So that's a really good opportunity for them to start um, collecting information from um, outside organisations about courses that they might want to do. They don't get two hours. No. <laughs> the reason I get two hours, uh, they come through in half an hour cycles. So they're in three groups will come through in the morning. And then at their first break, if they find something really interesting, they want to go back and give them more information. At first break, they can come back in and have um, like they don't need to be with us. They can just come in and see any people they want to see to follow us more information if they want to at their first break tomorrow. So the other thing that we'd like to remind our students about is that there is a bigger um, expo that we would encourage you to go to. Um, the Careers and Employment Expo, um, the Brisbane one, is on the tw uh, May the 20th and 21st at the Brisbane Convention and Exhibition Centre. Um, obviously, there will be a lot more, um, many more organisations there for them to um, get information from, to chat about possible options, career pathways, um, you know, university um, courses that they want to study, entry requirements, all of that kind of thing. So lots and lots of career advice. Um, and it's free. And it's free. And it is a really good um, starting point to start those conversations and start to be thinking about what do I want to do when I leave school? Um, all of this is going to happen. I know it seems like a long way off yet, the beginning of 23, but it's going to happen fairly quickly. Um, and we've got to make sure that you know we have thought all of this through so that, as I said before, we can make um, informed decisions. We encourage them all to go because there's Basically, if they're very smart while they're there, they'll be able to get enough pens to get them through the two years and enough stress balls that they'll be fine. There's a lot of merch, a lot of merchandise. <laughs> so, hopefully, we get some good um, information from there as well. Okay, so that brings us to our set planning in term three. So, week two, term three, we will um, have a interview with each and every student and their parent or parent. Or both parents and parents, whoever wants to come in, really. Um, so, we will have that um, send out more information about how you book those appointments when it comes closer to the time. We'll use the same booking system that we do for our parent teacher interviews. But each of those interviews um, will go for about 20 minutes. And we want both students and parents, obviously, to be actively engaged in those conversations. And that's where we will sit down and we will be asking questions like, do you see yourself on an ATAR pathway or a non ATAR pathway? Do you want to go to uni or not? Um, what are your interests? What subjects are you good at? Um, where do you see yourself in five or ten years' time? Um, you know, all of those kinds of things. Do you have any information about courses that you want to do? And then we'll sit down and choose the, the subjects that they will study in years 11 and 12 and look at all of those prerequisites to make sure that they meet the requirements for all of those subjects and make notes and make a plan there for their studies for year 11 and 12. As I said, from then on, if things change, the student changes their mind, their interests and, and things change, then we can offer us a reset plan towards the end of the year. And again, we'll send out information about that. 
Um, so what we will do prior to that is we will send out one of these forms to all of our new tens to help them um, start thinking about what subjects they might want to choose. We'll also give us a bit of um, preloaded information about where they kind of see you know, themselves going. We can also help that to tailor our interviews and make sure that we're on the right, um, the right track when we're talking to you and your student about the possible subjects that they might choose. So you can see they're starting to think about what level of English that they would like to study, the level of math that they're wanting to study, and any other subjects that they have an interest in. So that will be um, issued shortly. <laughs> so let's just leave it at that. That's good cover <laughs> um, Okay, so again, as I said, we're going to use the SOP system to, um, to get those uh, set planning meetings booked. Um, so more information about that will come. So the, only, the only change might be is if we get day map up for parents. I know Mr. Basky is telling me every day he's getting closer and closer. If we finally get the link out for you guys so your parents can actually get on day map as well, you'll be able to book through that. But that might be a world of new learning for me and I might just resort back to SOBS to make it easy for myself. But preferably I'd like to try and get us all on using the new software. So if we can, we'll be on that. That'll be the only change in that space. Yeah, and, and given we may not have you as a captive audience here again until after set planning is done, can I please encourage you to be um, proactive in after we've done the set planning meeting, if you suspect there are any changes in what your student um, is planning to do with their career, uh, to make that second set planning meeting so that we have got the right mix of subjects for them sending them into year 11. Year 11 is, um, you know, obviously a, a big step up academically. Um, some kids find it, some kids love it, and off they go there into their subjects that they love studying, but other kids find it a bit confronting with the amount of work that they have to do and the amount of study that they have. So by getting them 